अखंड मंडलाकारम व्याप्तम ये न चरा चरम तत्पदम दर्शितम ये न तस्मै श्री गुरवे नमः हरिओ ओम तवकथामृतम तप्त जीवनम कवि भी रीडी तम कल्मशापहम श्रवणमंगलम श्रीमदाततम भुविग्रन्ति भूरिदाजना ओम नमो भगवते सिद्धांकिष्ठान रीडिंग्स फ्रॉम एंड रिफ्लेक्शंस ऑन द लाइफ ऑफ होली मदर from the book called Holy Mother Sri Sarada Devi. This book is authored by Swami Gambhirananda Ji. We are now in the sixth chapter, page 160. First, let us go through some readings. We have noticed the mother's diligence at the Kshineswar, Shampukur and Kashipur. At Kamarpukur too, the same assiduity was in evidence. Rather, it increased because of the manifold responsibilities she was burdened with. She got together all that was necessary for cooking food, cooked it and offered it to Raghuvira with all punctiliousness. If Shivudada happened to be at Kamarpukur, he performed the worship. Otherwise, somebody else did it. Before the daily worship commenced, the mother finished her bath in the Haldar Pukur and started cooking on two ovens. And this was finished before the sun moved away from the veranda, that is before noon, it being unbefitting to offer food to the deities after midday. Of a truth, the mother tried her best to follow the master's wishes. She was ready to wear herself out at Kamar Pukur through toil, tears, privation and disease. But there is a limit to endurance, whether physical or mental. Where the environment is wholly unhelpful or antagonistic, one with a sense of self-respect cannot continue spiritual practices long in a course of strenuous adjustment and compromise. Differences of outlook were that to be sure. In addition, the moral and spiritual atmosphere of the village was unbearable for her. The way in which the influential young men of the village misbehaved towards the monk from Murissa, disregarding the intervention of such a venerable lady as Prasannamai, set the mother thinking much about her own future. And on top of all this came the insistence calls from her children in Calcutta, which ultimately proved too strong for her affectionate heart. Ultimately, Kamar Pukur ceased to be her main place of residence. This does not, however, mean that she neglected her husband's bequest. It only means that she took up her task in a wider and more effective sense. And though she did not permanently stay at Kamar Pukur, she spent money for the proper maintenance of the master's cottage. If any devotee went that way, she reminded him, of its sanctity and advised him to spend the night in it so that he might imbibe some of its holiness. She helped her nephew Ramlal with money in putting a new story over their own dwelling house and she bestowed particular care on the worship of Raghuvira and spent money for the purpose. Her later day disciples were curious for details about her leaving Kamar Pukul and plied her with various questions. One devotee asked her, Mother, you don't such as visit the master's house. When you come to the village from Calcutta, you go straight to your father's house. Are you in this, treading in the footsteps of your predecessors? The mother laughed heartily and replied, Not so, my son. Can I forget the master's house? Shibu is my godson, but the master is now no, no longer in the physical body. I am pained if I go there. That's why I don't go. 
The irremediable pangs of separation was there to be sure, but to that were added the external maladjustments owing to antagonism, negligence, and iniquities of the people around her, of which she seldom spoke as it hurt her to expose others' faults. On rare occasions, only she opened out her mind a little. To a boy devotee who attended on her, she said, When after the master's passing away, I moved about here and there for some time and then went to live at Kamar Pukur, my relatives seemed to be indifferent toward me. And coming to learn of the high-handedness of the villagers, my mother brought me here to Jairamadi. She did not allow me to live at Kamar Pukur anymore. From that time on, I have been living with my brothers through stress and strain. And now again they complain, she does not look after us. The human mind is strange indeed. Thus, the chapter comes to a close with the title, In Her Husband's Cottage. We saw how Holy Mother Sri Sarada Devi spent her days, particularly in Dakshineswar, when first time she came. And later, when she started living with Master in Dakshineswar, she had, of course, a lot of problems. She had to cook, that's the very main work for her. And then she had to attend to hundreds of other activities there. She would hardly get time, even for taking rest. It was so difficult for her. And her privacy, that's very important for a woman. And uh, being of the very shy nature, the Holy Mother was, her privacy was in a great problem. And so, to avoid all the um, all types of uh, familiarity with the people, early morning, before the sun rises, she would go into the Ganges and take her bath and come away. So it was a very big problem for her. In spite of that, she would, she says, my days in the Chinesa was, I was like a, like a, it was a joy mart, a mart of joy. That's what she used to say. It was a mart of joy. She was very happy there. And with all the happiness, of course she had to undertake all these difficulties. But here we are seeing how when she came to Kamarpukur after Master's passing away, it was she was supposed to stay there for some time. But then in Kamarpukur also there were a lot of difficulties. See, it is said that uh, when Sri Ramakrishna passed away in Kashipur, at that time, Mother became, felt, she felt that she has become a widow. And uh, according to Hindu tradition, a widow cannot, cannot wear all the ornaments which she used to wear. And she cannot wear colorful sadis. So she had to put on a white sadi and she has to take out all her ornaments and in much more traditional families, even the women take out their hair also. They have complete shaven hair they keep. So we see that type of traditional uh, people also in several places like Brindavan, Kashi, etc. If you go, you can see that people. Even in my own house, I have seen my grandmother, who was a widow, was wearing only a white sari, never wearing a colorful sari. I have never seen that and she would have complete shave on it. So a barber would come once in a month and he would shave. So this type of very, it was very, very, uh, very strict way of living for the widows. That was what prescribed in those times. And she, was, she had to undergo that. But then when she came to, it, it was, she also thought she should not wear all these ornaments. So she took away her all other ornaments. And the last one was kept with her, the bangles. And she wanted to remove the bangles from her hand. At that time, it is said, the mother reminiscences that master appeared and told her, no, don't remove the bangles. And the bangles were given by master, made 
for her with idea of what he saw in his vision of mother sita he had vision of mother sita and saw at that time you see how keenly he was observant he saw what mother was wearing in her hands and the same bangle he instructed the uh, the jewelry man to prepare and he prepared exactly like that so he came and told her no no don't remove the bangles let it be there so with this she went to kamarpukur now you can see the kamarpukur a traditional village where people are all very orthodox and they found this lady she is wearing bangles what a widow should not wear any ornaments and she is wearing ornament so they started you know speaking in love so there are many times she had to endure all such things but how long you will compromise and you will adjust is a question the author raises here very neatly he says how beautifully he puts it that that how long one can go on adjusting and uh, accepting the compromise differences of outlook he says where the environment is wholly unhelpful not even little helpful let's say wholly unhelpful or antagonistic one with a sense of self respect cannot continue spiritual practices long in a course of strenuous adjustment and compromise that's why you have to leave the place so she left and another reason for her leaving kamarpukur was the insistent and continuous calls from the devotees of calcutta they were telling ma you come here and stay in calcutta so balram babu's wife was telling her please come and stay with us so everybody is calling her so she thought let me go and stay in calcutta but then kamar pukur had a great attraction for her because she it was her husband's place and also another reason very important reason for not staying in kamar pukur was she could remember the days of her wonderful days that she spent with master in that place so i have come across some people like that in south africa when i was there so the husband has passed away and the lady doesn't want to stay any more in that house she has told her son change the house to some other house so that i can stay in some other place and she shifted so when the lady came to me i asked why did you want to stay in the place where you and your husband stayed for long she says that is the reason i cannot stay there because i am reminded of him everywhere and in every place i know that where he used to sit where he used to walk where he used to eat etc etc so that is causing me lot of turbulence in mind that how can i stand that when he is not there that's why i want to go to some other new place and start a new life as a widow so that also has been an important point she says to ramla that why she doesn't want to stay put in kamarpukur and she says no no i have not forgotten somebody asked her have you do i don't you go there the mother laughed heartily not so my son can i forget the master's house shibu is my godson but the master is no longer in the physical body i am pained if i go there that is why that is why i don't go so the irremediable pangs of separation was there to be sure and then of course added to that kamapu kamarpukur was not very welcoming a village for mother so she did not go and stay there that's these are the reasons we find but then the raghuvir's raghuvir's worship has to be done and uh, when she was there she used to do the raghuvir's puja otherwise somebody else would do raghuvir is no is a deity of master sri ramakrishna it is uh, the deity was worshiped by his predecessors by his forefathers <coughs> so it is called kula devata you know in the hindu system of uh, uh, god worship you find three types of devatas are given one is 
you are born into a family and the family is worshipping a particular devata. So that is called Kula Devata. So the Kula Devata is one such that your predecessors, that is fathers, fathers, father, fathers, father, they all worship. And when the new Bahu, that is the daughter-in-law comes to the home, so that the son is handed over the same deity. So the daughter-in-law and the son have to now or continue the worship. Like that, from son to from father to son, father to son, it goes on. So that type of deities we have seen, sometimes Shalagram is kept, or some deities, Murti is kept, like photo is kept, like that. So our pictures are kept. So this Kula Devata system is very famous. And then of course, Hinduism says you have got a local deity. A local deity is something which is called Grama Devata. So after the Kula Devata, Grama Devata. <coughs> so Grama Devata, what is Grama Devata? Grama Devata is a deity worshipped by all the people in that village. So every village you find, it has got a separate deity. Or the same deity may be in several other villages also. So you find that a group of villagers may be having worshipping on particular deity. So in Kamarpuku, we find for Ramakrishna's Kola Devata was Raghuvir. Raghuvir is none but Sri Ram. Sri Ram's another name was Raghuvir because he was born in the Raghu Kula, in the lineage of King Raghu. He was born and he is a Veer, he is a very strong man. So he said Raghuvir he was called. So Ram's, Ram was the Kola Devata. And where Kamarpukur is there, nearby, there is a Devi temple. So the Devi temple, the Devi is uh, uh, masters, Grama Devata. And now you find there is a third kind of Devata that is worship and that is called Ishta Devata. Swami Vivekananda in his Bhakti Yoga lectures, he says this Ishta Devata concept is something very unique in Hinduism. Particularly in the devotional methods of worship, this Ishta Devata comes. That means you have been told that many, many Devatas are there. Of them, according to your own uh, tendencies, you are drawn to a particular name and form of a deity. So some people say, I worship all deities, I go to all temples, but you know, Krishna is very, I am very fond of Krishna's form. Some people say, I am very fond of Ram's form. Some people say, I am very fond of Hanumanji. So like that you find that each one, according to his temperament, according to his tendencies, he is drawn to a particular deity. And that deity is called Ishta Devata. So Amirakanda translates it as chosen deity. The chosen deity. That means you choose a deity. A Kula Devata has been imposed to you. You are born into a family and the family worships a deity and that deity is not your deity. It has been imposed upon you by being born in that family. And Grama Devata is also like that. It is an imposed deity. Because you are happen to be staying in that village, you are also worshipping that deity. But there is no imposition in this. You become the leader. You decide which Devata you should have. So this is a unique concept that you can choose your deity and that is called chosen deity, Ishta Devata. So in Ramakrishna's life you find that he was very fond of his Kola Devata, Raghuvir, as well as the Grama Devata, local Devata, that, um, what is the temple? In Kamarpukur. Uh, yes, Vishalakshi temple, Vishalakshi was Grama Devata. And then you find this his sister Devata became Mother Kali. Completely three different uh, uh, varieties you find that. But then this is how every Hindu family is connected. In the same family you will find they may have common Kula Devata and common, uh, common uh, Grama Devata. But Ishta Devata may be completely different. If there are three children in the family, each child will have one one deity. That's why you find in the traditional families, if you go, if you go to in India and visit some Hindu families, 
you will find in their puja room, you will find all the deities are there, so many deities are kept, so many pictures are kept. You used to wonder, what is this, so many deities are there, but then the reason is because if you have five children and mother and father, so seven people are staying in a house, you can understand, seven people have in seven Ishta Devatas. So each one will have put his, his picture. So the deity, that's how we find lots of deities pictures are kept in a family. So that's a part. So here Kamar Pukur, we find this uh, Visalakshi Devi is the Grama Devata and Kula Devata is the Raghuvir and Master's Ishta Devata was, of course, Mother Kali. Now in this, what we found was, is one of the things that he says, though the mother was in extremely indigent condition in the beginning, matters improved a little in course of time. I am just going back on this. The devotees coming to know of her difficulties organized what help they could. In addition, her share of the landed share left as a trust by master in the name of the family deity and the Lakshmi Jala land which came down from the master's father Kshudiram as a heritage yielded sufficient paddy not only for herself but also for some charity. Towards the end of the period we are discussing now there was a maid servant named Sagarir Ma who helped the mother in her domestic work. From her it has been gathered that she used to do the shopping for the mother. A portion of whatever the mother cooked at noon, she kept in a pot for Sagar Irma and when the woman came, she handed it over to her saying, put this in your mouth first and drink some water and after that begin your work. During the three days that the goddess Durga is worshipped annually in Bengal, special worship was done and offerings made, by Shit, made to Sheetala by the Chatterjee's at their Kamarpukur house. Brahmins were fed on this occasion. When the time for the feast came, the mother used to say, Shibu, that is Shibuda, you spread the leaf plates and serve salt and water while I serve rice on all the leaves for the Brahmins. Shagarir Ma further says, Hers was the store of Lakshmi, as it were. Nothing ran short. Whatever surplus there remained, she lovingly gave away to us the next day. Over and above all this, the Holy Mother fed a number of guests. This was a great indication, you know, when in Chitrakut, when Sri Ram came and stayed you know, on his exile, that was the first stoppage, you know, he came and st st stopped there. There we find Mother Sita used to cook for all the Rishi guests coming. And when Ram was staying there, and so many people used to hear about Ram's coming, and they all used to, rishis used to come. Sometimes thousand rishis used to come. And Mother Sita's duty was to cook for all of them. And uh, it's a very beautiful place near Nagpur. There is a place called where uh, you can go even now there. They show that this is the, uh, 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 the Rasoi Ghar of Mother Sita. They show it like that. Mm -hmm. So where Mother Sita used to prepare food. So, likewise, Mother uh, Sarada also used to prepare food for all the guests. And once they all take, uh, take their food, then she, even if there is a balance is left, she would, not, uh, she would not leave it just like that. She would just give it to others the next day. So, Sagar Irma used to come as a domestic help and she would give her first, she would put her in a pot and then give her. Put it in your mouth first and drink some water and after that begin your work. So before beginning the domestic work, something the maid servant should eat. So that's a very good example of mother, see how mother used to say this. Now we we'll go to the next chapter with the devotees. It took quite a long time for the news of the mother's misery at Kamar Pukur to percolate to the Calcutta devotees. The young monks were then travelling here and there, impelled by the desire for a life of absolute surrender to providence. They therefore knew nothing of this. Swami Saradananda said afterwards, We could not then imagine that the mother could not even get 
a pinch of salt. After eight or nine months, when the devotees learnt the true state of affairs, they finalized their plan to accommodate her in Calcutta and then transmitted their request to her. The mother knew what was in the hearts of the devotees. She was aware of the irrationality of rejecting the call of such loving followers and continuing in the adverse atmosphere of Kamar Pukul. Yet she could not make up her mind without considering fully a few intricate questions. The master had reminded her off and on that modesty is the highest virtue of a woman. Would she be able to maintain her habitual seclusion in the new surroundings? The second question was more serious, or rather it was the first question in a more complicated setting. Her travels between Jairambati and Dakshineswar were nothing uncommon from the social point of view, so long as the master was there. But now that he was no more, could the mother proceed to Calcutta, overriding the prejudices and narrow notions of village folk? The mother herself related how the problem was solved. When my coming here, that is to Calcutta, was being talked of after the master's passing away, I was at Kamarpukul. Many there said, Good heavens, there are young boys. How can you possibly live with them? I knew in my heart, of course, that I would live here. Still, one has to take account of public opinion. And so, I consulted many. Some again said, Why, of course, you should go? They are all disciples only. I simply listened to all that they said. Now there is an old widow, Prasannamayi, in our village, whose opinion is respected because she is very virtuous and intelligent. I went to her at last and asked, What do you say? She replied, Fancy, you will certainly go. They are disciples as good as your sons. How can such a question arise? There can be no two opinions about your going. Hearing of this, others also consented. Then I came. This is a great problem for a Hindu widow staying and she is only 10 years elder to Swami Vivekananda. Can you understand? And she was in her youth at that time. And how the people, the, actually the village people, they can talk so many things. They are telling being a widow, you will go and stay in Calcutta with those disciples of Sri Ramakrishna. And disciples of Sri Ramakrishna means and Ramakrishna's consort, her disciples also, they are her sons like. But then the village's mind, they thought in a different way and said, no, it's a danger for a woman to go and stay like that. No, you should not stay, like that they were telling. But then how she can reject the devotee's calls, you know, Sri Ramakrishna's disciples headed by Saradananda, they heard mothers, mother did not even get a pinch of salt. What a terrible affair it was. Our own Guru has passed away now and Guru's wife, her, his consort, is suffering in Kamarpuka village and with so many types of adverse comments about her and she is staying there and she could not even properly eat there. How can we remain silent to this? We must take care of Guru's wife. You see, that's a wonderful idea of the disciple. The disciple not only looks after Guru, but also looks after Guru's families. So Guru has passed away, okay, but then his wife is still there. We cannot neglect her. We should go and take care of her. So they contacted all the Calcutta devotees. And the Calcutta devotees said, yes, we must bring mother back to Calcutta. Let her come here and we shall take care of her. Whatever is needed, very little only is needed to take care of her. Let us provide this. You know, that's the devotees' hearts are always like that. You know, and since you have come today, I want to tell you, when I came here, and when Swamiji also shifted here to this Nivedita house, earlier he was in Blessington Street. I think you must have gone there. And then he shifted here. And then, suddenly we two Swamis are here. And Swami Purnananda was very interested that what I will eat because I am coming from India. And then 
I am not adjusted to this bread and butter, you see. So what I will eat? Will I get some Indian food or not? He was very worried at that time. What I should eat? And he says that he can cook and feed me, but I have still doubts about that, whether I can eat what is cooking. But then, what I will eat? So it was a big problem. So, but then, the devotees came. The devotees saw our condition. And uh, I am started eating bread. You know, bread has become a solid food here after coming here. <laughs> Previously, bread was the last item I would touch. But now here, for every morning breakfast, I must have bread. So, now I have now adjusted to that. So, we find that. And the devotees started coming. They understood, oh, these two people are staying here in this house. But what they will eat? And every day, we can't prepare. And you know, going to uh, purchase things, groceries, etc. and cook here. So they decided. So they formed a committee and the women folk formed a committee. And every day, even today, one devotee brought the food. Every day, devotees bring on rotation. For 15 days, you know, the 15 devotees are put in, in a rotation. And every day, one person comes and brings. So, we say that devotees have got another way of perspective. The perspective, you know, about things. We may say to them, no, I don't want to eat. So one day, of course, we have made, Wednesday, said nobody should bring anything to us. Like that we have said that. So either what, we will make something, or we will go somewhere, and when you go for cultural tour outside, we can go to any restaurant and eat also. So that's a change, you know, for us also. So everything has been considered. But then the devotee's perspective is that the two swamis are staying here and they are not having any food. How can we allow that? We cannot allow that. The same way, you see, we are not their gurus. You see, but then they are able to think about that because we come in that legacy, you know, in that uh, hierarchy. So they said, oh, our swamis are staying. How can we leave them without taking food? That is the perspective. So you can understand this when Ramakrishna's devotees, disciples, how much they would have felt for the Holy Mother. Even at this distance, we are able to, the devotees able to feel for us. That means you can understand the devotees of Sri Ramakrishna who have seen Holy Mother and how she serves Sri Ramakrishna, they have seen that. How can they now keep quiet hearing all the different difficulties of Holy Mother? So they told her, Ma, you come. But then there are two reasons. One reason is that she has to leave Kamar Pukur and come back and come to Calcutta. Another big reason was this reason that young boys are there. All the disciples of Master were young. And then you go and stay where? In the mud. How can you stay in the mud? It is a men's mud. So no women is allowed to stay there. So how you stay there? All those questions came. And then Naturally, the village people, they will talk like that. But mother did a very wise thing. She went and asked the Prasanna Mayi Devi. Prasanna Mayi is one of the very wise old widow of the village. At every village you find some wise old widow would be there. And people would go and ask her opinion. And she would give that. So mother went and asked this lady. Because she was virtuous and intelligent, the whole village respected her opinion. So mother went and said, Mother, Ma, Prasanna Mayi, Ma, tell me, should I go or not? What she said, she said, you will certainly go. They are disciples as good as your sons. And all the disciples of Sri Ramakrishna would call Holy Mother as Ma, as Mother only. So they are as good as your sons. How can such a question arise? There can be no two opinions about your going. So that cleansed the issue. Because that reminded mother, I must go now. So that's how she came to Calcutta. Sometimes in May 1888, the mother came to Balaram Babu's house in Calcutta. Balaram Babu was the one of the very serious, uh, serious and senior devotee of Sri Ramakrishna. Sri Ramakrishna used to love visiting Balram Babu's house. And Balram Babu's house is considered as a, as a drawing room of Sri Ramakrishna. 
So she used to make that comment about Balram's house. There are so many wonderful things have happened in that house. Either at this time or near about this, we get a profound insight into the inwardness and God absorption of the mother. That day, as she sought for meditation on the roof of Balram Babu's house, she entered into Samadhi. When she emerged from it, she said to Yogin Ma, I saw I was in a far off place. All were treating me there with the utmost love. I became very beautiful. The master was there and with great tenderness they made me sit by his side. I can't describe the bliss that I enjoy. <clears throat> when I regained my consciousness a little, I saw the body lying here. Then the thought came to me, how can I enter into this ugly body? I had not the least desire to resume it. At long last, I managed to get into it and then consciousness returned to it. It appears to us as though the discord between the intrinsic divinity of the mother and her physical vestures became intensely vivid through that vision at the same time that she became more fully aware of her real identity and felt that through God's dispensation she had to work for the good of the world in and through such uninviting environment. This is one of the wonderful idea that we get about the Samadhi of Holy Mother at Balram Babu's house. She went into Samadhi and then after coming back from Samadhi, she is telling to Yogin Mahar description of the experience. See, this is something, a very strange experience, you see. She said she saw a very far off place where she doesn't know. And today when you see that far off place from Calcutta, Holy Mother is now worshipped and adored and taken as Ishta Devata of many people. If you go to Argentina, you know, recently we have received an Argentina Swami. One Argentina Swami came here and he used to say, in Argentina, more than Ramakrishna, Holy Mother is adored. And that is one place where you get Holy Mother statue, where in no other place you find outside India. So, that people are so mad about Holy Mother. They read her books and then they say, Holy Mother is our Ishta Devata. Chosen deity, they say. And they think of Holy Mother. Today we see that how on that day, somewhere in 1888, Holy Mother saw this, that she has gone to a far off place. And there, people made her sit by the side of Sri Ramakrishna. I can't describe the bliss that I enjoyed. And she says, when she saw that, and then she regained her consciousness, she says, at that time, she saw her body was lying there. That means, she went out of the body. This is a very one of the beautiful concept of the Siddha Yogis. They say that a person, while living, can leave his body and then go around and then come back and enter into the body. So this is one of the very highly uh, yogic uh, power that uh, yogis use that. We find in, uh, in the life of Shankaracharya, Adi Shankaracharya, that he kept his body lying and he left his body and he entered into the dead body of a king to understand certain intricacies of life's problems. He went there. So the story goes like that. And then he came back. And then his body was lying there. He entered into the body. So the soul, or what we call that, uh, the Atma, can go out of the body and then it can come into back into the body. So there are some people, nowadays modern parapsychology is now investigating. There are a lot of research going on all over the world. They say, how a man who is about to die, experience the death. So this is called a near death experience. So this uh, NDE as it is called, this near death experiences 
when you read in internet you can see how wonderful it is and the man says that he is just al almost left his body and he could visualize the body is lying there in the room so he can see out of the body and he can go out he can come back and it said that the there is a purana one of the important puranas hindus uh, depend upon for knowing the post journey after life so there is a life and the body is dead so after the body is de dead then there is another journey there is another life journey starts so the garuda purana very detailed way it describes so in most of the uh, hindi speaking areas i have seen that garuda purana portions are read <clears throat> when a man dies so the pandit comes and he brings the book also with him so he reads the portions of that and the garuda purana says how the man is dead now so the soul <clears throat> that means man chitta buddhi ahankar with five pranas this is called the sukshma sharira the subtle body so the vedanta says we everyone has got three bodies one is the physical body and there is subtle body and there is a causal body inside the subtle body there is a causal body so the causal body inside the subtle body leaves this physical body and the garuda purana explains that how the physical body is lying there the subtle body goes out and it stays for 13 days or 16 days according to the tradition where you are born it will go moves out and then they do some certain rituals after the rituals that subtle body is released from that area and then it goes into the wide world and then it moves into the world for one whole year after one year then you have to do some another ritual then it is cut off from this world and then it goes into different lokas so if you go to puranas you find that there are 14 lokas are mentioned so each soul after the death will go to a particular loka according to the karma and bhavana that it has got so whatever you when you deserve for a particular loka you go to that loka and stay there till you get another birth into this life so this goes on and on this called samsara you know that is death and birth and death and birth this cycle is goes on so this says that when mother saw her body separately so the author swami gambhirananda ji analyzes this this experience given to mother is a wonderful experience no doubt she looked at that because in that vision she had a beautiful body now she saw a very aged body lying there she said how it is ugly body how can i enter into this ugly body like that she thought like that i had not the least desire to resume it somehow she says she managed to get it to eat she had to come back you know lot of work is there for her how many people are going to get mukti because of her grace how can she leave her body and go away so she came back into her body at long last i managed to get you into then consciousness returned to it so swami gambhirananda ji analyzes this he says that the difference between intrinsic divinity of the mother which is in spirit by nature and that she is holding a body which is separate from the spirit this has been well imprinted on the mother's because of the mother's experience in her mind at the same time she became more fully aware of her real identity so she felt by this experience what are the benefits that she got she felt her real identity who she was she was not the body she was a divinity that she understood that she she it was well established and then because of god dispensation she had to work for the good of the world for that she has to enter back into the body so how beautifully this experience has been concluded by swami gambhirananda ji he says so well that this is how that it, the interpretation can be done of the mother's experience 
So we shall proceed further in the next week. <coughs> Om Kripam Kuru Mahadevi Suteshu Pranateshu Cha Charanasraya Danena Kripa Mayina Mostute Om Shanti 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 Hari Yom Tatsat Sri Ramakrishna Arpanamastute